Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Did you tell somebody about Jesus this week? Uh, had a couple of opportunities and I was tickled to death about that. So uh, I hope you'll, uh, you'll be thinking about this, that this next week and tell somebody about Jesus. What about reading your Bible through? You feel good about where you are in reading, reading your Bible these days? Okay. Um, in our reading for this week, we were in Leviticus and Matthew. And in Leviticus, there was a discussion about clean animals and unclean animals. Uh, those that you could eat and those that you were forbidden from eating. And there was uh, a very specific uh, instruction about uh, marine animals, uh, fish. So uh, it said, what kind, uh, so the question was, what kinds of marine animals were clean? And uh, so, and everything else is unclean. There were two, two distinctive uh, characteristics of clean animals, or clean fish. Um, catfish wouldn't qualify because they had to have fins uh, and scales. So fins and scales. So catfish has no scales. So it would not have been considered a clean, a clean fish to, to, to eat. Um, and uh, eels, uh, uh, we have eaten eel before, but they have no scales either. So they would not be considered a clean marine animal. Jesus told a parable about 10 virgins or bridesmaids. And there were two categories of those. Um, and uh, what were the two categories of the virgins in the parable that Jesus told? There were five that were wise and five that were unwise, okay? And uh, the wise bridesmaids came prepared to wait and, and, and have an extended waiting period and the five foolish did not. All right, in, back in the Old Testament, there was one day a year that was set aside for a special moment in the history of, of, of Israel. And it was on that one day when the high priest was allowed to go in to the holiest part of the tabernacle and offer uh, uh, blood on behalf of the children of Israel. And that was the only day that he was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. What day was that? It was the Day of Atonement when the high priest went in to take the blood of the, the, the sacrifice for the sins of the people and, and sprinkle it on the ark and the, the, the mercy seat. So the Day of Atonement was the, uh, the answer to that one. We're in John chapter 9, and we're going to be wrapping up John chapter 9 today with one of the most poignant discussions or I should say illustrations of the difference between light and darkness and sight and blindness. And you'll remember from last week we were talking about the man that had been born blind who was now had been healed by Jesus and uh, then as unbelief began to investigate that miracle, they really didn't want to know the truth. They were looking for some way to leverage this event against Jesus because he had healed him on the Sabbath day. and They, uh, they were just livid over that because he broke one of their rules. So, um, they examined the guy, they examined his parents, they examined the guy again, and he just gets frustrated with them and, and says, why do you ask me this again? Do you want to become one of his disciples? Oh man, he, he was putting it on them. 
And uh, uh, they said, well, you were born in sin and you dare to instruct us? And then they kicked him out of the synagogue, out of the, out of the temple, excommunicated him, actually. Uh, his whole life, he had never been qualified to be a part of temple worship because he was blind. And anybody that was impaired physically could not be a part of temple worship. So as soon as he was healed, he became eligible to be a part of temple worship, but before he could participate, he got kicked out. Um, and what was his crime? He told the truth. Do you know there are still people in religious organizations in the church today that don't want to hear the truth? They will, um, uh, they will offend people uh, because they don't measure up to their preconceived notion of how they ought to act and look. Um, so that, that is still going on today. And there are people that have been hurt so deeply by people in the church that they vowed to never go back. And I've known some of those people. Um, but let's look at the text today. It's, it's only a few verses. Uh, so somebody read the first a few, and that'll be uh, John chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Somebody read that for us. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have not seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Yes. And then 39, 40, and 41. Somebody read that for us. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be, and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have not you would have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. In the first 34 verses of this chapter, uh, uh, as we looked at it, it's all about physical sight. Here was a man that was born blind, and God, uh, Jesus, uh, who is God, uh, created new eyes for the guy and gave him sight, physical sight, when he had been completely blind for his entire life. Uh, and now, in verse 35, we begin to shift from physical blindness to spiritual blindness, spiritual sight, spiritual blindness. Um, and the blindness that is evidenced by the Pharisees is just staggering as you, as you put it in the context of they have seen miracles. They've seen the results of miracles. They've heard about miracle after miracle after miracle that Jesus has done. He has fulfilled and checked off every box that the coming Messiah was going to check off. And yet they are blind to it. Now, this guy um, uh, gets kicked out of the synagogue. And I want you to, I want you to think about this, that uh, uh, verse 35, Jesus heard that he had been mistreated. Jesus heard, it says here, that they had cast him out. Don't you know that anytime you're mistreated, he knows and he cares. He hears, he sees everything. And when you're mistreated, he knows it. He cares and he is moving to do something about it. Whether we realize it or not, when we get mistreated, he is on the move, okay? 
So, uh, and in this case, it says Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, isn't that fascinating? Jesus healed the guy. The guy gets mistreated by the religious elite. And then Jesus comes to find him. Um, spiritual sight. We've shifted from physical sight. Now we're going to be talking about spiritual sight. There are four things that I want to just note in our, in our study. That first, spiritual sight requires divine initiative. This guy didn't go find Jesus. Who found whom? Jesus found him. The God of the universe. Think about this. The God who created everything, created them. When this guy's mistreated, Jesus comes to find him. And if we are ever to have spiritual sight or if we're to be awakened spiritually, it's not going to be because of something that we have done. It's not going to be our initiative. It's going to be because he has sought us. He has come to us. So spiritual sight requires divine initiative. And we see that here. Uh, Jesus came to find him. Do you know why Jesus came? What, what did he say? I came to seek and to save those who are lost. So here we see him in the very act of doing it. He is seeking. He found the man. He went and, and, and went to where he was. And don't you know, that's the way Jesus treats us. He comes to where we are. We don't have to get ourselves cleaned up. We don't have to get ourselves in the right attitude. He comes to us. And he comes to us at times when we're least expecting it. If you're hurting, we really don't expect God to come and come to where we are in our pain, but he does. He does. So he found him and, uh oh screensaver went dead. Um, so there's a, there's a buzz going on in the temple area about this guy who'd been born blind and never in the history of the world had anybody ever who'd been born blind been healed. And so there was a great discussion going on around the, uh, the temple area. And as this verse opens, that buzz is still going on. Um, and uh, the buzz that's going on is about physical sight. The guy's got new eyes. He can see. And he goes. Uh, uh, Jesus makes mud, puts it on his eyes, and he goes to the pool, and, and he washes, and he receives his physical sight. But Jesus doesn't want to leave him there. He is on his way to spiritual sight. So the, the sight of the soul. And um, uh, in John chapter 15, verse 16, we'll get to that in a few weeks. Jesus said, you've not chosen me. I have chosen you. Aren't you glad that Jesus chose you? Jesus chose me. It wasn't our doing. It wasn't that we were good enough or, or sought him well enough to find him. He was seeking us. Um, so Jesus found him, and then Jesus spoke into his life, and he says, do you believe in the Son of God, or the Son of Man, as it says in some translation? That's referring back to Daniel 7, uh, where the Son of Man is, is, is introduced as the coming Messiah. The Son of Man, the coming Messiah. And uh, Jesus says, do you believe? 
in the Son of God? Or do you believe in the Son of Man? Uh, and his answer is, is, is just uh, uh, fabulous. He says, who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? He was ready. He was ready. Do you know that, that when God puts somebody in front of us to tell about Jesus, you have no idea how much prep work the Holy Spirit has done in their life to get them to this place. And, and this man was ready. He says, I, I'm, I'm ready to believe in him if I just knew who he was. There's a world of folks out there that might just be ready to believe in him if they knew who he was. Uh, uh, when Austin Till was in this room, a few weeks ago. He's a missionary to China. And he was talking about an encounter he had among a bunch of students in China at the university, or one of the universities there in Beijing. He said a young man saw that there was an, an American uh, in the crowd, and he comes pushing his way through so that he could meet the guy. And when he does, they get to talking, and and, and uh, Austin asked the man, uh, what do you think about Jesus? And the guy said, what is Jesus? And you know, we are immersed in uh, messages about Jesus. It's on the radio, it's in print, it's, it's all around us. We come and we worship Jesus. But there are people that have no idea who Jesus is. Uh, there are people that have been saved by uh, uh, knowing just a little about him. Uh, uh, there are uh, uh, Ecuadorian Indians who uh, follow the God of the path. You know, they've been told that there's a path to righteousness. There's a path to God. And they worship the God of the path. Uh, uh, they don't, their theology is not perfect. But you know, isn't that amazing? It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. We just have to place our faith in him. And, and that's the second point. Spiritual sight responds with faith. Uh, here the guy says, uh, uh, who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Here's a blind man. He just got his eyes. <laughs> and Jesus says, you're looking at him. You're looking at him. And it is he who is talking with you. See, he had heard the voice of Jesus. When Jesus uh, uh, spoke to him, and told him to go wash the mud off of his eyes. He had heard him speak, but he had never seen him until this moment. And then he lays his eyes on the Son of God, uh, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, and what's his response? Verse 38, Lord, I believe. So spiritual sight first is initiated by God, because he is come to seek and to save, and then it responds in, in faith, uh, and it recognizes Jesus as Lord. He says, I believe. And then the next phrase in verse 38 says that he worshiped him. Real faith, real spiritual light, real spiritual sight always results in worship. And that's, that's, why, that's why we come together is because God has done something in our lives to change us, to give us a new life. Um, I was talking to a fellow the other day. He said, uh, I've got a car that is a lot like me. 
And uh, he said, it's ugly. You may know who I'm talking about. He says, but it's got a beautiful interior and a new engine. Like me, I got a new heart. Yeah, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, but that, that, is, that is it. When, when, when Christ comes, he gives us a new, a new heart. And, and then our response is worship. Uh, and worship is action. It's doing things. Uh, and we've got people that are beginning to get involved in, in ministry around here. Uh, my particular passion is celebrate recovery. And, and we've got uh, uh, people that will be stepping up to do the children's ministry, to do the teenagers' ministry, uh, to help with, with food, to do a food pantry. We're partnering with Musk Ministries. I had a meeting with some of those folks. Uh, I had a meeting where one of those, a couple of those folks were in the meeting on Wednesday. Um, I got to uh, speak to a bunch of preachers on Wednesday morning at the mayor's prayer breakfast. And uh, uh, I, I explained, most people don't know what recovery is until you get involved in it. So you don't know what the 12 steps are, went through the 12 steps, and you don't know what we, uh, we, how we serve people and what hurts we're able to help people with. I read off the list of anger, divorce, depression, uh, uh, pornography, gambling, all, all these things, uh, pride, and then alcohol and drugs. And then when I got through, I said, guys, uh, if you didn't see yourself anywhere on this list, we also help people with lying. So <laughs> they got a charge out of that one. <laughs> but uh, but it, uh, when new life comes to us, we respond with worship. And uh, so we're, we need, we're gonna need help with with singers, keyboard, drummers, computers, guitarists, uh, the landing, which is the teenagers ministry, greeters, uh, and others who, who might find uh, a way to serve to uh, the Sober Recovery Ministry. And uh, uh, we're, if the church if the church is a hospital for sinners, it's certainly not a museum for saints, but more effectively, it is a hospital for sinners. Then Silbert Recovery is the emergency room, okay, where we get the worst cases. Uh, and, and people will come to Silbert Recovery that will never come to a Sunday morning service, but they will eventually if they spend time in celebrate recovery and find healing, uh, that's one of the ways we introduce them uh, to Jesus and his church. So Jesus says, do you believe? And the guy uh, uh, says, who is he that I might believe in him? I'm ready to believe in him. There's nothing more exciting than to to, to share the gospel with somebody that says, yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, uh, Chris McDaniel, who was uh, with us when we kicked off that first night of Celebrate Recovery, uh, was at an event last night where over 200 men got saved. 200 men. Uh, there's a revival going on in multiple places around the country right now. Uh, the, the typical site is the one in Asbury, uh, at Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky. And it's been going on for two weeks now. And uh, around the clock, I uh, had some friends that showed up Friday night at 11 o'clock and the place was packed. Uh, still. And uh, they don't want named performers coming. They don't want the named evangelists coming uh, because it's a student-led ministry. And um, it, it's a beautiful thing. There's, there, there's a revival that has broken out at Sanford University in, in Birmingham, in, at Auburn, 
University and other places. I was reading uh, uh, an evangelist that just came in off of the road having spent two weeks preaching the gospel to students and over 20,000 kids came to know Jesus during that tour. So something's happening. People are ready to hear the gospel and respond, and they respond with worship. So spiritual sight requires divine in, in, uh, uh, initiative. God's, God's doing it. Uh, and respond, and, and we have to respond with faith and believe, and it recognizes Jesus as Lord, and then it results in worship. So that's the process and then there's spiritual blindness too that, that we have to be aware of because it is everywhere, it's all around us. Uh, I was reading a CNN article this morning about the, the event in Asbury and the guy that was writing it didn't have a clue about spiritual things. Not a clue. Uh, by the way, they don't want the news outlets there either. This is not about making headlines. Um, but anyway, this was, this was an article by CNN, and it, it just was uh, uh, not on target, okay? It wasn't bad. It's just the person that wrote it just did not understand the things of God. Uh, but blindness. Uh, so this guy worshiped, and Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world. Now, he, didn't say, he said, I didn't come to judge the world in another place. He said, I came to seek and to save. But those who willfully reject him are judged already. Okay? Um, so I've come into the world, and a result of that is judgment. And those, uh, that those who do not see may see. Here's the guy. Okay? He didn't see and now he sees. Uh, and that those who see may be made blind. Those in the, the church, the Pharisees, oh, we're the, we're the enlightened ones. We're the ones that see all of y'all are blind. That was the pride that they were uh, consumed by. Um, and he says, so that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were standing around why were the Pharisees always around him? They were, I think they were trying to find something that they could use to trap him, to use against him. Um, so some of the Pharisees who were there with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But you, now you say, we see Therefore, your sin remains. Jesus stated there, there's some things about uh, blindness, spiritual blindness. The first one is it brings judgment. If we don't see Jesus for who he is and accept that, we're headed for an eternity without God. Um, so it brings judgment. And, and it's stubborn because they had seen all those miracles that Jesus did. They had heard about all these things that he was doing. They knew that he met all the criteria that the Messiah would meet when he came. Uh, but they were so stubborn in their pride they would not accept it. Uh, spiritual blindness rejects sight when it's offered. Jesus is making an offer to them over and over and over again, but they stubbornly refuse to accept it, and the only result can be doom. Now, there were some of the Pharisees that believed. Nicodemus was one of them. Uh, we see him helping Joseph of Arimathea take Jesus off the cross and get him into a tomb. Uh, but there, most of the Pharisees did not believe. They went on in their stubbornness, and ultimately, faced the judgment of God. So it is our job as believers to be out telling the story of Jesus because we have no idea who is already ready, ready to hear it and respond to it. So let's make sure we tell somebody about Jesus this week.
Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. We are so blessed to have sight. Help us to be faithful in sharing the gospel so that others might come to see and to believe and to become worshipers alongside us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right.